Unit 10, Comfort, Pain, Rest, and Sleep. So noise, so excessive noise. So there's been research, uh, nursing research related to noise in healthcare facilities and the impact that it has on um, residents, patients, clients, but also on staff. And so what's ultimately been decided through the research is that excessive noise is um, it causes an increased stress response both for the staff as well as for the patient. So it uh, delays healing impairs the um, immune system function, increases heart rate and blood pressure, so is in increasing those vital signs, and then causes the patients to feel stressed and anxious. So interferes with sleep. So again, sleep is one of the um, basic human needs, that bottom level rung on Maslow's hierarchy. Uh, and it may trigger wandering and confuse patients. So if patients with dementia, Alzheimer's, it may cause um, increased agitation, causing them to wander and then may cause patient dissatisfaction with care. So ultimately our, our goal is there's some noise, especially particularly in places like the ICU where you're gonna have monitoring and you're gonna, you know, you, you try to do as much as you can with what's appropriate. So if it's a necessary noise, if it's something that we can't really control, um, that's one thing. But if there's noise that we can control, if there's um, music, if there's other procedures that are taking place that can be quieted, we should be doing so. So patient comfort. So all humans need comfort, rest, and sleep for physical and emotional well-being, health, and wellness. So again, we talked about sleep being that bottom level rung of Maslow, but also comfort, rest um, for physical and emotional well-being. So comfort is the, the definition of comfort is a state of physical and emotional well-being. So the patient is calm and relaxed, so not in pain or upset. So again, uh, we want our patients to be comfortable as much as possible so that they're really in this state of physical and emotional well-being. So pain, and we talked about this in a previous unit as well, but um, pa pain, patient responses to pain are really varied and different. And so what we really need to keep in mind is that we should always be concerned about pain. So pain is never a normal response. So again, it may be somewhat expected after a certain procedure or surgery or something, but we're, it is always as, um, indicative of something going wrong in the body. So it's always a, a, you know, a manifestation of some sort of physical problem. So some patients may try to deny pain um, out of fear. So they're concerned if they report their pain. Um, a lot of times they're in denial about a disease process or injury. And so they think, okay, if I just deny the pain, then that means I don't have a problem. So just being aware of that. Unrelieved pain. So there's a lot of um, diseases that cause continuous chronic pain. So fibromyalgia is a great example of this, where um, really the, the diagnosis is made on how many pain centers do you have in your body? How many spots of pain are you having at any given point in time? So this is really important. Someone who's in unrelieved pain is at really high risk for suicide, for all kinds of other complications, because they're constantly living with this constant pain and stress on their body. So it really has the potential to affect all areas of a patient's life. So you need to identify patients in pain or at risk for pain. Uh, so patients have the right to timely pain assessment and management. And so what pain assessment is, is when we go in, the patient says, I'm, you know, I have, I have pain in my stomach. So how we assess it is, okay, so what is your pain on a pain scale? We report that pain to the nurse. She looks at what appropriate interventions she has. So for example, does she have pain medication that's been ordered by the physician? And then treating that pain. Um, you're never going to question the validity of patients' complaints of pain. So again, patient, um, pain is a really individual um, response, and so we can't say just because one person appears to be in more pain than the other, we don't know what they're feeling. And so we really have to use the patient's self-report of pain as their pain level, and then we ask them in as objective a form as possible. So what is your pain on, a, on this pain scale? And if they give us other indications of you know, it's piercing or it's throbbing or it's aching or whatever words they use, you're going to report as objectively as possible to the nurse. So you're going to try to restate exactly what the patient has told you so that is as objective as possible.
So patients may be smiling, talking, or sleeping and still be in pain. Uh, what's really important to remember with pain and, and medicating pain is that you always want to stay ahead of the pain. So it's much, much harder to treat someone when their pain gets to a point where it's it's um, a really high pain level, so they're in the nines and tens. So what we try to do is, is manage that pain by giving regular scheduled medications, and then we often have medications that are given um, as needed for breakthrough pain. So we give them these standard meds on a regular schedule, and then something else on top if they ha if their pain is starting to break through. So if they're having additional pain even while being medicated. So what's important to remember is you know your your nurse Miss Jones says go check on your patient. Um, you know I'd like a pain scale. You walk in and Miss Jones is sleeping. So what you need to do is wake her up and do a pain scale because we can't assume that someone's sleeping means that they're not in pain. And what may happen for Miss Jones, she'll wake up and be in excruciating pain, and we haven't kind of stayed ahead of that pain. So it's very important that, you know, regardless of how they appear, you're still going to get an objective pain scale on how they're doing. Uh, so also vital signs may be normal. So for some people, if they're in pain, their blood pressure rises, their heart rate rises. For others, their vital signs may be completely normal. So you can't use that as an indicator of um presence or absence of pain. So always avoid making assumptions about the patient's pain. So, you know, Miss, Mrs. Jones is sleeping, so I'm going to assume she's not in pain. You need to find out, is she in pain or is she not in pain? And the only way to do that is to ask her by giving, you know, asking her, is she in pain and at what level is that pain for her? So um, pain always requires further intervention, so it should never be ignored because, again, it's our body's way of telling us that there's something going on, okay? So it always requires further intervention. It always requires reporting what you've heard from the patient to the nurse, okay? Uh, so you're going to report verbal complaints of pain and describe pain in the patient's exact words. And we just talked about this in terms of is it excruciating, is it stabbing, is it aching, is it throbbing, whatever word they use to describe the pain that's going to help with the nurse with their assessment. So pain assessment scales. So you can use a pain scale to help assess and manage the patient's pain. And it's really a communication tool. So again, we're not having to guess what their pain is. They're going to tell us specifically what that pain scale is. So this one down here at the bottom here is a, a di diagram version of pain scale. So often used maybe if um, if they're not English speaking or if um, if it's a child they may use this scale so if it's somebody who's having a harder time describing the pain using the traditional pain numeric scale so um, the numeric scale is rating the pain by number so obviously zero meaning absolutely no pain and 10 being the worst pain possible and again we're letting them make that you know that decision for themselves what is that pain for them Okay, so word scales, so it's used to help patients select words to describe the level and intensity of pain, and you have examples of these in your textbook as well, but it just, it gives you an opportunity to use different scales depending on which clients or patients you're working with. If they're having trouble using that pain rating scale, the numeric scale is what's used most often, but if they're having difficulties with that, you have some other resources available to you. So planning patient care. So you're going to plan to give care after a patient has taken pain relieving medication. And this has to do with, so um, example, if the nurse is going to be doing a dressing change later that day, she's going to medicate that patient. You know, if the medication takes 30 minutes to kick in, you know, the, the dressing change is at noon, she's going to give pain medication at 1130. What that's going to do is help you, um, help the patient make sure that they stay comfortable during the procedure. And so they're able to kind of tolerate what needs to be done. Um, in addition, you're also going to be able to, to provide nursing comfort measures. So a back rub maybe to help relieve pain. Um, positioning is a really important thing for pain as well. So if you can reposition someone and that can help um, decrease their pain, that helps as well. A lot of times it's even just creating a comfortable environment for them. So yeah, a lot of facilities are using more alternative methods such as aromatherapy or lighting, you know, so maybe switching the lighting that's being used in the room to sort of decrease some of that, um, 
the stimulation, which will help with some sort of with, with comfort. Um, and then always monitor the patient's body language for signs of pain. And again, what you're going to do is notice, okay, so every time you move Mrs. Jones's right arm, she kind of um, has her facial expression changes, she pulls her arm away, it seems like she may be in pain. But again, you're going to take that information and, and take it a step further and say, Mrs. Jones, are you having pain? If she says yes, then you're going to give her the pain scale. So again, don't make an assumption about it, but it is a clue that maybe she is having some pain in that arm. So rest, so this is another definition here, a state of mental and physical comfort calmness and relaxation. So um, again, be aware of these. These may be on your quiz as well, sort of the, def the definition of sleep and rest. So again here, um, sleep, the definition is the period of continuous or intermittent unconsciousness. So the patient's physical movements are decreased. But again, just make sure you understand the difference between sleep and rest in terms of definition. Um, and then it's really a basic need of all humans. So allowing the mind and body to rest. And we talked about that in terms of, um, of hierarchy of needs, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that that is one of those bottom level needs. So nothing else can be... Um, um, you know, you're know, you not going to get to a, a place where you feel comfortable and secure and safe until you have met those bottom level needs, which sleep is one of. So nurse aid measures to promote comfort, rest, and sleep. And these, there's a lot of these tips in your book, but um, you'll really see these once you start working in practice. And they are also very um, variable depending on which resident or patient you're working with because we have, all have a different sense of kind of what promotes comfort. So basic nursing comfort measures, they're used to relieve pain and helping patients rest and sleep. So, um, you know, a lot of times we think of pain, we think of medication. But there's a lot of other things we can do as nurse aides to help promote comfort. So positioning is a really important one. You know, do they need more pillows? Do they need, you know, limbs propped up? Or are they having some skin breakdown? Or what's going on with that person? Um, and then kind of their sensory environment. So changing those things as well. Sometimes um, massage can be very helpful. Back rubs, those kinds of things. So just being kind of aware of, of thinking outside the box of, of what may work for any given resident or patient. So if something has been found to be helpful, um, it, the specific measure may be listed in the care plan. So when they do a care conference and decide, okay, you know, th this is what's really worked for this per person, then really every staff can be on board of trying to encourage those, um, those interventions so the patient is comfortable.